All right, let's now go to President Cyril Ramaphosa, who's addressing a dinner hosted by the South African chapter of the International Association of Women Judges. The South African chapter of the International Association of Women Judges and Deputy Chief Justice Designate Justice Mandi Samaya, Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Justice Raymond Zondo, Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, Minister Maite Nkwana Mashabani, and Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Ronald Lamula, Vice Chancellor <coughs> and Principal of UNISA, Professor Puleng Lenkabula, members of the judiciary, as well as magistracy, members of the legal profession, academics, as well as students of UNISA, of which I was one of them two years ago. <laughs> Distinguished guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I was invited <clears throat> by Justice Meyer to come here, it was with a little bit of trepidation because I recalled some time ago when members of the media and members of parliament heard that I had spoken to Justice Zondo on the phone, <laughs> there was a storm. <laughs> and when <laughs> Justice Meyer said, I want you to come to this function, a storm developed in my head. And I kept wondering, what are they going to say now? <laughs> you went to a function where <clears throat> there were a lot of judges, but where still you sat in between the chief justice and the deputy chief justice designate. I said to myself, they will ask, what were you talking about? <laughs> which is what they wanted to know. But then when the laughter started, when all of you started laughing, I said, I'll tell them that we were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and with Deputy Chief Justice Designate Maya sitting next to me, having heard something, some gossip about Macarena, and then the musicians started playing a song. I saw her go like this <laughs> next to me. I said, we attempted to dance. <laughs> if they were to ask me, I'd say, we attempted to dance. So I have a full story to tell to whoever will ask me about my presence amongst judges. So it was filled with laughter, a lot of humor, and attempted dancing and having a wonderful meal. It is indeed an honor to address this esteemed gathering of women jurists as we commemorate Women's Month in South Africa. When Justice Meyer, was it you who said, and you whispered to me as well, that male judges are also members of this chapter and I asked her, I said, how come male judges are members of a women's association? She said, if, even the chief justice, he supports our work. And I said, but how does it happen? And she says, but they don't have a vote. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk about equality. <laughs> and I must tell you all, there's no equality in this association. <laughs> Which reminds me of uh, when uh, Vali Musa was 
the Minister of uh, uh, not Constitutional Affairs, but when he, no, 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 not even that. He was once a Minister of Local Government, which we call Local Government at the time, which we now call Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. So his job was to go around the country, visit municipalities and all that. So he went to one municipality in the Northern Cape. And when he came back, he said, Brur, you don't know. In that municipality, the men are really oppressed. <laughs> I said, well, how come? He says, the council is made up of eight women and two men. And the, the men there are thoroughly oppressed. So I'm finding inequality in the association as well. I'm honored to be here, particularly during Women's Month. And in a way, it takes me and should take many of us down memory lane. As we remember the courage and the resilience 66 years ago of 20,000 women who took on the might of the apartheid regime and marched to the union buildings to demand an end to the degrading and dehumanizing laws that were applicable then. And the Vice Chancellor of UNISA says she has a photograph of me pointing at her university when President Macron visited. When we have heads of states visiting our country, we give them the official reception at the amphitheater at the Union buildings. And as I welcome them from their cars where they are dropped, we go past these two rocks. One rock made up almost like a calabash and the other one on top, which as we would know in our rural areas, they used to grind maize. And I tell them that this is a representation of Imbogoto. And then I tell them the story of the 20,000 women who marched to the Union buildings. Those two rocks are permanently there at the bottom. We walk around them. And I said, this is the symbol. And indeed, this whole Union buildings is a symbol of the resilience of the women of our country who marched to the Union buildings with great courage and bravery to challenge the apartheid regime. And it is at that spot where I pointed also at the Furtrecker Wochte, but also pointed at your university professor, Len Kabula. And this is what I often do with all the heads of states to tell them about the story, an event that took place 66 years ago, an event which I believe inspired the women of our country and in many ways became the pillar that enabled us, one of the pillars that enabled us to bring an end to this apartheid system. Although nearly four decades would pass before apartheid was abolished and our own country's democracy would be born, the activism of those 20,000 women and their bravery had far-reaching consequences that extend till today. So I'm particularly pleased to be here as we are now in the month that celebrates the women of our country. And it is a joyous moment for me to be sharing this evening with women judges accompanied by non-voting male members in their association. The Women's March of 1956 sent a clear message to the apartheid regime, indeed to the world, that ending undemocratic rule and advancing women's rights was an important 
goal of our national liberation as casting off the bonds of racial oppression. That is why when we became, we became a democracy in 1994, we set ourselves clear and measurable targets to advance the position of women in the workplace, in government, and across society. That was one of the clearest goals, and that was inspired by the resilience of the women of 1956 and many other women who struggled against oppressive system from time immemorial. We produced one of the most inclusive constitutions in the world with a bill of rights that specifically requires equal treatment for all regardless of sex, gender, or any other ground of discrimination. We repealed all laws that discriminated against women and replaced them with a number of other laws, some amongst them being employment equity laws that oblige employers to reflect the country's racial and gender composition in their hiring practices and to advance the rights of persons with disabilities. We also prioritize greater representation of women in top management in the public service with a particular focus on black women. By 2021, 62% of the entire public service workforce was female. This is never really paid attention to. With 44% of senior management positions being held by women. In 1994, women comprised 28% of members of parliament. Today, 46% of our lawmakers in the National Assembly are women. Great progress that we have made. Of the 28 ministers currently in cabinet, I mean currently, 13 are women, with one having resigned because she had to go elsewhere. So we have one less position, but that one less position is going to be filled. And we've had 50% representation in our cabinet, the first time ever since 1994. And as South Africa, we are proud, we should be proud of the progress that we have made with respect to the representation of women in important public spaces or spheres of public life, notably the state. This administration that I lead has demonstrated its determination to build on this progress that we've been making. In 2019, we appointed Advocate Shamila Batoi to become the very first woman to head the National Prosecuting Agency. Hitherto, it was held by men right from 1994, and we changed it around. It's headed by a woman. In 2021, just last year, Ms. Pindile Baleni became the very first female Director General in the presidency and basically in charge of the full state system, a woman having that position. In 2022, Ms. Tembi Majola became the first director general of the state security agency. Also this year, we've been making great deal of progress in a number of other areas, making sure that we do indeed empower the women of our country in the state system. And this we will not shy away from making progress on an ongoing basis. And as we do so, we are particularly focusing on how the women of our country can be fully and properly empowered. And that is why last month, 
the Honorable Justice Mandy Samaya, who, as you know, I don't know whether you know her, <laughs> who is the president of the South African chapter of International Association of Women Judges, was appointed as our country's very first female deputy chief justice designate, a woman. And I wish to congratulate you once again more publicly, Justice Meyer, for having acceded to this position. And you've acceded to this position because it's a richly deserved honor and yet another milestone in a very stellar career that you have had. You are where you are because of your capability and it's great stuff, it's the cherry on top that you happen to be a woman. And you are an inspiration to all women on the bench, women at the bar, and also in the magistracy. But you're also an inspiration to that young girl who is still at school, those young people who are at university. Your accession to that position inspires them to show them that, yes, this is a country where all of us, particularly women, have, can have the opportunity to rise to the top. Today, out of 256 judges on the bench, and Minister Lamola did touch on this, 114 are women. Nearly half of all magistrates are women. And you can compare the two figures that the minister and I are giving. Most encouraging is the growing number of young women entering the legal profession. As of January 2019, more than a third of the candidate attorneys were black women. As a whole, women accounted for 57% of candidate attorneys. This provides impetus to the broader transformation of the legal profession. And last week, government, as minister was saying, we published for comment the draft legal sector code the code aims to ensure the legal profession is representative of the demographics of South Africa and to enable equitable representation appointment to the judiciary as well. Importantly, it also focuses on the provision of things such as pro bono services and community-based legal services, ensuring access to affordable legal services for all South Africans, particularly the marginalized, the poor, and rural communities as well. There can be no doubt that the racial and gender transformation of the bench is ongoing and can be improved. But we must at the same time acknowledge that we have come a long way, not just a long way, but we have also come a difficult way from where we've been. Gathered here this evening are jurists who have waged titanic struggles to earn the right to reach the pinnacle of the legal profession. And some of them were talking here about being insulted, being demeaned, and having to crush glass ceilings and getting injured in the process, the scars on their backs and so forth. That is where we have come from. And it has not been an easy road. Besides the fraternal and collegial bonds that you share as jurists, there is also a commonality of struggle to overcome bias, discrimination, sexism, racism, and other prejudices in the course of your careers. And yet, you still rise. And yet, you still break that glass ceiling. And to paraphrase Maya Angelou's eternal poem from a past that's rooted in pain, still you rise. And you are here because you've been rising. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for not being discouraged. And I want to thank you for being brave 
in your careers like the women of 1956. Keep them in your mind during this month, how those women were mobilized throughout the country and gathered together. They traveled by bus, by train, and got to the union buildings to go and talk to Stradom, who was the then prime minister, and he ran away, I'm told. <laughs> but they were brave, and they could have been injured, they could have been killed, and I don't know whether they would have arrested 20,000 of them or not, but they were 20,000, and some of them are still alive till today. And it is in their honor, in their honor, and in a number of ways you are also following on their footsteps and maybe you are standing on their shoulders. And during this month, I'd like you to remember that. And it has been the International Association of Women Judges that has also been your anchor as you navigate the complexities of progressing as a female jurist in an environment that still remains overwhelmingly male. Justice Meyer, before I came this evening, I googled this organization. Yes, I just did not want to land here without knowing what it does. <laughs> I googled it, and I found that even in the United States, their own chapter in the United States is a chapter that seeks to do precisely what you are doing to be an anchor, to be supportive of women judges, because it's a global problem. It is a massive global problem, and I'm glad that you set up this association, those who did in the past, and because it is a powerful, influential global network of juries who are committed to ensuring women's equal access to justice, in the face of discriminatory laws and practices, as well as barriers to justice for women and ever prevalent scourge of gender-based violence. And I want to congratulate you on hosting this conference and to applaud you for choosing the theme, empowerment as a tool to fight gender-based violence. Now, program director, you stood here and you started looking into 2023 and gave an order that I should be there in August 2023. But you forgot that you were not roped. So it's not an order. <laughs> you were just expressing a wish. So, and if wishes are horses, many of us can ride. <laughs> But I'll keep it in mind, and maybe in one of your judgments, you can just digress <laughs> when you are robed and give this order, then I will come. <laughs> As many have said, gender-based violence is a pandemic. When we were in the midst of COVID-19, it became evident that gender-based violence was spreading in the most alarming way and largely also in part because of the terrible situation that our people were exposed to, the destruction of livelihoods and the destruction of opportunities to work and people were homebound and we started hearing horrific stories of how you know, fathers were, 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 were raping their own children, their relatives and so forth. And that is when we then said, gender-based violence is another pandemic. And it is indeed another pandemic that we have to deal with. It is a massive problem that we must deal with to ensure that we bring it to an end. Minister Nguana Mashabani speaks so eloquently about it all the time. And even as we take a step towards women representation, which is improving, and the advancement of women's rights, which has now become something that we have all embraced, and many of us have embraced, and we want to see 
women's rights being advanced and being protected. But gender-based violence takes us many steps backwards. Last week, news of, that we had already of the gang rape, which Justice Maya spoke so eloquently and so touchingly about, much more than I could ever do. The news that we had last week of the gang rape of eight young women by armed men brought home once again the horror that confronts many women in our country and around the world as well. No society can lay claim to being non-sexist if that country's women live in fear. They live in fear as we had, as we heard from my sister Mujanku, that when she leaves home or daughter leaves home, she has to be on the phone. They live in fear in the streets of our country, in the pathways of our rural areas. Where sexual assault and domestic and intimate partner violence and femicide is an ever-present threat. This terrible crime was not an isolated incident, what happened in Kahiso. In the same week, more women were assaulted, were raped and murdered in different parts of our country as we had. We are in the grip of what is no less than an unrelenting war on the bodies of the women and the children of our country. We know that in many jurisdictions in the world, women and girls are also subjected to human trafficking, to discrimination, to abuse, to exploitation, and the worst forms of violence. And in some parts of the world, they are even denied, almost physically denied, even to get an education. The state has a constitutional duty to protect women against all forms of gender-based violence, which continue to impair the exercise of women's fundamental rights and freedoms. But at the same time, the men of our country also have a duty, a duty to also protect and to respect the women of our country and to uphold their rights. Our law enforcement agencies must do everything in their power to ensure that criminals who have violated the fundamental rights of women and children are caught. Our courts also have a duty to adjudicate these cases without fear or favor, and in doing so, to send a very clear message that gender-based violence, violence rather, will not be tolerated. As the Constitutional Court said in a 2019 judgment, this court would, not, would be failing rather in its duty if it does not send a clear and unequivocal pronouncement that the South African judiciary is committed to developing and implementing sound and robust legal principles that advance the fight against gender-based violence in order to safeguard the constitutional values of equality, human dignity, and safety and security, the Constitutional Court said. Never has the role of female juries been more important in our country right now to implement new and existing laws designed to strengthen the fight against gender-based violence. But it's not only the duty of female juries, all those who sit on the bench, be in the magistracy, be in the judiciary, to support and protect those who are victimized through gender-based violence and the survivors as well, and to ensure that perpetrators face the full consequences of their actions. But Justice Meyer is right. When a woman is killed, we cannot bring her back. 
But what we need to ensure is that we apply the laws and we apply them to the full extent so that that can continue to be a deterrent and a lesson to those who would want to abuse women. As government, we will continue to work with all our social partners because this is a societal problem. It is a problem that all of us need to participate in curbing, in stopping. Today we held the Civil Society Summit where we brought together more than 400 organizations that work amongst our people and we all agreed as we signed the agreement, the framework agreement, that all of us have a duty, all of us must work together to address the societal ills that are prevalent or exist in our country, be it unemployment, be it poverty, be it inequality, it is, those are the societal ills that we need to address. But we also touched on gender-based violence. It is a problem that we must all address. And I've often said that at times when these terrible things happen, they are known in the community. We also get to know who does all these things. So all of us must act together. Act together to stop gender-based violence, to address it in the most meaningful way. And where, for instance, a police station does not have the various kits that it needs to have, it is us as members of the community who must raise this and say, we have found that you do not have the test kits. We have found that the vehicles that should be there to protect the community and especially to protect women are absent. Make sure that they are there. And these are some of the challenges and problems that we need to address jointly, together, so that we rid our community and our country of some of these ills. In January this year, I, ass I assented to three key pieces of legislation to strengthen the legal framework in the fight against gender-based violence. Among other things, these laws tighten the sentencing provisions against perpetrators. It enables online applications for protection orders and improve provisions related to the to sex offenders register by widening its scope as well. And we commend you for your commitment to a common program of action to realize a truly non-sexist society that is free of all forms of gender-based violence. And we commend you for your long-standing commitment in applying the law with a keen understanding and appreciation of the gendered nature of poverty, inequality, unemployment, as well as underdevelopment which still persists in our country. We know that it is women that disproportionately bear the brunt of all these many social ills. And I've often said that the face of poverty in our country is worn by a woman. We know that it is women who are more likely to be unemployed, to have lower levels of education, who also shoulder the burden of childcare. Dr. Ramukhopa explained it extremely well, and she has explained the, the, the impact of all these and measuring up with minutes, the number of minutes women spend in just taking care of all of us and the very little minutes that we as men spend. And all this just shows the inequality. And all of, many of these things also impact on access to justice. For these and many other reasons, we look to all of you, especially the female or women jurists, to help to shape and strengthen the discourse around patriarchal power relations 
and what must be done to dismantle these patriarchal relations. And some of them have been in existence for many, many, many years. As jurists, you occupy a very important position to exercise judicial authority, which is the cornerstone of any constitutional democratic order. And we look with keen interest to the proposals, Justice Meyer, that will emanate from this conference that you are going to have, that you are having, particularly around empowering women judges to effectively use the law to deal decisively with gender-based violence, but at the same time, to help empower even the male judges to be able to be sensitive to how we can use the law to advance the interests of, of women in our country. Now, courts are impartial arbiters committed to the administration and dispensing of justice. That is their foremost role. At the same time, we have a rightful expectation that the courts should reflect in their judgments the foundational principles of our constitutional order, namely human dignity and the achievement of equality. The achievement also of non-sexism and non-racialism. And this is where we also throw a challenge to the academic world, to our universities, to be more active in doing the analysis and coming up, as my sister Mujanku said, with proposals that will shed light on the path that we have to traverse. The struggles of women continue, and they are global. But we must make the struggles of women here in our country lighter. We need to ensure that we empower the women of our country. When it comes, for instance, to pay for equal work, I've raised this and I'm glad that it was also raised by Justice Meyer when she was looking at how the remuneration for Banyana Banyana uh, is being doled out. But she goes further, she says, it's not, it's not an issue that should be much more topical now. It should have been from a long time ago, and it hasn't been. So we still do not have equal pay for equal work in our country. And one of the thoughts that has come to mind in my own head and the head of a number of colleagues is that we should legislate, really legislate for equal pay for equal work, so that there should, discrimination should stop. Now, we also need to take action against discrimination on the basis of motherhood, marital status, and sexual orientation. That we should. Now, Justice Meyer, I'm sorry to be making you a topic of my, my, my input today. She, she is so descriptive, so descriptive to a point where she felt that she should make the real point. She brought her son who was born when she was on the bench. <laughs> and it's a question of motherhood. And she scrounged around and said, will I get that four months? Will I get the four months or not? Because it's not clear. She also talks about the sexual harassment policy that is not there in the judiciary. And sexual harassment policies must be everywhere in various organizations because it is a disease that happens and we must stop it. Now, in a number of countries, there is also no equality when it comes to education, where it is physically stopped. In our own country, we need to make sure that more and more women, young girls, do get to school and they get their education. And they should never be stopped from getting an education because they have to look after a grandmother, after a mother who is sick, and they stop her from going to school because she's a girl. 
And we also need to address the issue of inheritance. Inheritance that, always, that often discriminates against women. Women need to be protected also against human trafficking and other forms of exploitation. And we must break all barriers and biases against women. And yes, Dr. Ramukhopa is right. Much of what we have achieved in giving recognition to women and making sure we advance women's rights has been largely because of the struggle that has been waged by the women of our country from time immemorial. But it also needs commitment from us as men who are in leadership positions to ensure that we do give real credence and effectiveness to the commitment that we should have. Our courts, enabled by a progressive constitution, have played a significant role in the promotion of gender equality in South Africa, truth be told. It is our expectation that the South African chapter of the International Association of Women Judges should continue to serve as a beacon of progress, a symbol of women's achievement, and as an instrument of change. This is a very important network that you have. And also to highlight the progress that we are making in our country, even more globally, so that others can learn from what we are doing. We are, from a constitution point of view, already the leading light in the world, and many, many others, including judges in the US, often look at our constitution and say, wow, we wish we had a constitution like the one you have in South Africa. It is the application of that constitution, which as jurists is now in your hand, the interpretation thereof. From the executive point of view, we need to be egged along to make sure that we apply it, we implement it. And today, I'm in wonderful company of judges and magistrates who should really be egging us along to make sure that we do live up to the promise that we gave to the women of our country, that there shall be equality, and the promise that we should continue giving to them that we will address gender-based violence and bring it to, the, to an end so that the women of our country can walk with their heads held high in the streets and the pathways of our country without fear that they will be either abused or molested. So I wish you wonderful deliberations and I wish if my program could have allowed I could be present even if yes, I would not have a vote, like a number of other male judges. So thank you very much. It's been a joy being with you here. Thank you so much. All right, that's uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa there addressing a gala dinner uh, with uh, uh, women judges, uh, the uh, uh, South African chapter, uh, speaking uh, about a number of issues, uh, referencing the uh, Women's March of 1956 and saying that uh, uh, the women of today, a lot needs to be done, even though uh, there has been quite a journey in terms of uh, fighting for equality. And he referenced uh, government and the public service, uh, mentioning a few statistics that point to the progress that's been made. But he also talked about uh, social ills such as gender-based violence and uh, violence against uh, children. And he said that this scourge is something that really needs to be addressed. And uh, that as a community, we have to work together to try and see this through. But he also says that uh, the women of today must continue to be brave and to continue to rise. That was the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa. You're watching The Globe.